Hello, welcome to I Care for Your Brain with Dr. Sullivan, board certified neuropsychologist here to give you brain health and empowerment you can count on to be your own best brain health advocate. We are finally trying to improve our audio and visual around here, so hopefully you can see me better and most importantly, hear me better. Today's topic is white matter disease. This is an audience request. Multiple people emailed me asking if I could do this topic tonight. This is one of the most prevalent pathological things that happens in the brain. And many of you find out you have white matter disease because you had an MRI or a CT scan for another reason. You get the report and you read on there white matter disease, but yet no one has given you feedback for this. So this is often what we call incidentally diagnosed, meaning that it's not the reason you got the brain scan, but it is information that's in your medical record. The problem is, is that you get zero feedback about it until now. This is part of what we try to demystify here on Eye Care for Your Brain. The feedback you might have gotten was that your brain looks fine. Meanwhile, you read the report and you can freak out. So I'm going to explain exactly what it is, how worried you should be, and most importantly, what is it that you can do about it. The brain is made up of mostly gray matter and white matter, okay? The gray matter mostly covers the outside of our brain. This is called the cortex, meaning the bark. And the white matter is more so on the inside, okay? There's actually more white matter than there is gray matter. So what white matter really is, is basically nerve fibers that connect different parts of the brain, okay? And it's covered in a myelin sheath, which essentially appears white because it's made up of exclusive exclusively fat along with a few other different types of molecules. So this is a protective sheath that goes along the axons of nerve cells in order to specifically conduct information, move information from one part of the brain to the other. The first confusing thing about white matter is actually the name of the different disease processes that happen. So these go by many different names. So you might have seen something like chronic ischemic brain disease, CNS, small vessel disease, leukoareosis, white matter hyperintensities, white matter, white matter lesions, lacunar infarcts, microvascular disease, small vessel disease. All of these basically mean the same thing, which is white matter disease. And basically what it means is that the blood vessels that supply the white matter have closed up broken off or swollen under pressure and aren't able to supply those nerve cells with the oxygen and micronutrients that they need in order to survive. So when those teeny tiny blood vessels aren't able to be supported, they essentially die off, which reduces or totally eliminates the energy source for those brain cells that were supplied by that specific blood vessel. White matter disease is an umbrella term. So this means you have sustained damage to a certain part of your brain and that cause is due to reduced blood flow. The question of course though is, what symptoms does it show? Does it show the same way in every person? Does it matter? Is it as scary as it sounds? Well, we need to start off with where exactly in the brain these things typically happen. They typically happen in the center of the brain called the periventricular spaces. And that's because the blood vessels in this part of the brain have the smallest diameter, as teeny tiny as a piece of hair. Imagine how small that is and how little damage would need to happen there in order to see issues, right? We think of, when we think of vascular disease, you can think about the aorta or the different blood vessels that supply the heart, which are actually quite big. You can even visualize them with your naked eye. These blood vessels that I'm talking about in white matter disease are so fragile. They're really the end of multiple branches that have come off the big two blood vessels in the brain, your carotid arteries, which are about that big, and your vertebral arteries, which are in the back, they're about that big, and they all kind of come together in the center. Those can be seen with the naked eye, and actually you can see um, the diameter there. What I'm talking about, though, is the much smaller branches that come off of those branches. So the further and further you get deeper into the brain, the more you have these very, very tiny blood vessels that supply the white matter, and that's typically where white matter disease shows up. So white matter can go wrong in four common scenarios. The first one 
his genetic causes. There's a condition called catacil that I've seen a few times in my career. Folks who kind of have a, a heritable reason for having blockages in the blood vessels that supply the white matter. People can have something called vasculitis or you can have secondary vasculitis. There are infection related white matter disease, but almost everyone that's watching this video that is concerned about white matter is concerned about it because of age, advancing age. So all Almost everyone, if you are lucky enough to make it to 90 years old, research tells me almost 100% of us are going to show signs of white matter disease on a neuroimage. So it's really something that's going to affect us all. White matter disease is different from multiple sclerosis. You might have heard of myelin before or white matter. That is much more related to an autoimmune reaction and an inflammatory response. So the damage that we see in white matter comes specifically from swelling. So these teeny tiny little blood vessels are very, very delicate. Like I said, diameter of a piece of hair and under pressure from hypertension or high blood pressure, they break off and basically cause a micro hemorrhage. So the reason we see the white spots on the MRI or the CT scan is basically that is showing fluid in the brain. Anything that has water molecules in it shows up as bright white on a neuroimage. So that's really what the radiologists are looking at when they're reading your MRI or your CT scan. They're basically looking at the pattern and the distribution of the white matter spots. So here is what is the hard news is that white matter, when it becomes severe, um, isn't good. It is associated with about 25% of strokes. And if you've had one stroke, your chances of having a second one more than double if you have moderate to severe white matter. It contributes to about 45% of the dementia cases that we diagnose. But the much better news is that the vast majority of you will have a result of white matter disease that doesn't actually show up in any meaningful way. Way. In fact, there's people who have moderate, even bordering on severe white matter disease, and on cognitive testing, they're doing fine. They're independent in everyday life. It's one of those things in my experience that is very frightening when you read it, especially because you weren't given any information about it. But if you actually went to see a specialist, a board certified neuropsychologist, you would come to find out that you're actually doing pretty good. So under the age of 30, white matter disease is pretty uncommon. So if you're that young, it's most typically related to one of those rare genetic conditions or migraine headaches. That's one of the other ways that we can see it show up. If you're between 30 and 60, this is around the age when most of us are going to have a little bit of white matter disease uh, building up, especially if you have three cardiovascular risk factors. So blood pressure is the big one, high blood sugar, or if you have a high saturated diet, okay, high saturated fat diet intake. By the time we're 65, between 75 and 90% of adults, if you scan them, their report is going to mention something about white matter. So what really matters is the severity rating. So the problem is not all radiologists rank the severity of white matter disease. So if it says age related or mild, you really should be completely fine. If it says moderate or severe, then you might want to push for an evaluation to see if something can be determined if it's impacting your cognition or your mood or your function. So I want you to think about a report of white matter disease as a serious warning sign that this means you are at risk for blood vessel blockages that could later down the road in a cumulative way go on to affect the health of your brain and put you at higher risk for things like stroke and dementia. As I said before, white matter disease is caused because of micro blockages and a lack of oxygen and micronutrients. So one of the ways I want you to think about this is, okay, if the problem is that it's essentially a circulation problem, maybe some of the solution would come from basically forcing oxygen to get up through the body and into the brain. That's exactly right. We're gonna talk about those recommendations. So I mentioned before, one of the biggest risk factors is your blood pressure, it's hypertension. So research tells me over anything over 140 over 90 is, is pretty bad for the brain. What we really know is the worst is if in a 24 hour period, we were to continuously monitor your blood pressure and we saw big spikes, we're looking for 
issues that make blood pressure go high and then also make it go low. So it's the variability of blood pressure that is particularly damaging to the brain. Other risk factors for hypertension related brain issues are history of smoking, uh, diabetes, untreated moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea and chronic kidney disease. Okay, so when a radiologist looks at an MRI or a CT scan, they're basically looking, I said this before, for the pattern and the distribution. And there's three different ways that they rank it. So between mild, moderate, and severe. The first one is a term you might see in your MRI report called punctate. So P-U-N-C-T-A-C-T. P-U-N-C-T-A-T-E, okay? Trying to multitask. Um, this is basically a few white dots here and there, okay? This is where we, we classify it as mild. We then move into moderate, which radiologists call patchy. So what this means is you've basically got groupings of white dots that they can see in a pretty familiar uh, formation. Then we go up to severe, which the code word there is confluent. This means that when they look at the image, there's two long streaks on either side, representing that the white matter disease is pretty darn advanced, pretty severe. So once we see that white matter disease is severe, this is where we can get into a secondary finding called brain atrophy. So when multiple blood vessels have died, which then kills off multiple brain cells, what we see is a shrinkage in the brain called atrophy. And a little bit of that is normal with age, but the problem once again becomes once it moves into the severe range. So when people have this severe white matter disease, there is a classic cognitive mood and physical syndrome that goes along with that. So white matter disease is all about location, location, location. So it all depends on which pathways are interrupted and that's gonna dictate where the problems are and what you see. So remember before I said it's this periventricular area that has some of the teeny tiniest blood vessels. That's most commonly where people, when they get into that moderate or severe, that's where it tends to show up. And so what we see is that there's really this syndrome that goes along that involves a couple different symptoms. The first one is you might notice change in your walking. So this is shorter steps. This is some balance issues. This is frequent falling. Okay. Then cognitively, we see difficulty with multitasking, being able to perform two or more activities at the same time. So maybe before you would be able to talk to someone on the phone and write out your checks or do like an express express uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and now you're not able to do these things. We also see a mood syndrome that is involved with difficulty with initiation. So kind of like a flat affect looks like depression, but if you start to get into the content of how someone feels, they're not sad, they're not guilty, they don't feel hopeless. It's just, they don't feel like doing anything. They kind of have lost their get up and go. The get up and go has gone up and went. So all of these things cause a decline in function. And that's oftentimes what brings people to a neuropsychologist is they can't do the things that they used to enjoy doing. So the problem really with white matter disease is that we often see a disconnect between one part of the brain and another. Specifically, that periventricular part of the brain is connected in a series of white matter loops to the prefrontal cortex. So that's where we get some of those difficulties with walking, the trouble with initiation, and the trouble with multitasking. So what can we do about white matter disease once it's at that stage of actually causing symptoms? So remember, it's gonna have to be pretty darn severe or advanced to actually cause someone's symptoms. So Unfortunately, there's really no treatment that is going to reverse what has happened. The very best that we can hope for is to stop it or reduce the severity of the progression. So we don't stint the brain, right? We can't get into clogged uh, blood vessels in the brain quite yet be above the carotid arteries and get in there and put in those balloons and blow all the yucky stuff to the side to increase circulation. We're not at that advanced stage in science yet. Uh, we can't get in there and repair things at the minuscule vascular level. But what we can do is aggressively treat the vascular health issues that have caused our white matter disease. So remember, you're gonna get the most 
valuable uh, impact from reducing your blood pressure, specifically the variability of your blood pressure. You also want to think about how to open up those blood vessels. Like I said before, statins are an evidence-based treatment for cerebrovascular disease, which white matter disease would fall under that heading. Uh, it, we know it lowers lipids. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it protects the inside lining of blood vessels. And we know that it helps with blockages in the major, the bigger arteries and blood vessels in the brain. We're still working on a little bit if it's really, really helpful in the white manner, but overall, I would say in general, you can improve vascular health through the use of statins. Number two is think about other behavioral ways to increase blood flow. You've probably already been thinking, I wonder when she's gonna get to exercise because exercise is absolutely the most robust evidence-based recommendation to improve the blood flow into your brain. So making sure that every day you try to move your body a little bit more than you did the day before, uh, really work on multiple times during the day of getting your heart rate up and active, trying to get to that point where you break a sweat. Other things that are evidence-based brain health recommendations for vascular blood flow in the brain are eating an anti-inflammatory whole foods diet. Engaged social connection can reduce your stress, which is also very good for blood pressure. And those symptoms that I mentioned to you before of that classic syndrome, those can be treated. So that's really the third recommendation. So the slow walking and balance issues can be treated with physical therapy. There's a specific type of physical therapy called vestibular rehab or balance rehab that we recommend. Most good physical therapists are able to do that and reduce that risk of falling. You can also do a little bit of mind over matter with this type of, of gait issue, which is where people can kind of tell themselves, take bigger steps, make sure you don't give in to kind of shuffling and hunching yourself over. Uh, the second one is you can try to get better at multitasking. So you can try to reduce distractions in your environment. You can try to do hard work when you are well rested, when you're fed, when you're not stressed. And you can also work on that decreased initiation by asking people, in your life for prompts, using alarms, reminding yourself that you are not going to feel like getting up and starting, but what are the benefits to you? Maybe even write them out on the refrigerator. How would an action be you living your values, right? So if you love your grandkids, instead of thinking of, I have to go to the gym and exercise, maybe think about getting out on the lawn with your granddaughter and throwing the baseball around. We also can see that urinary incontinence can be an issue with advanced white matter disease. So don't just accept those symptoms. Ask for a referral to a urologist. Use pads if you have to. Whatever you need to do to improve your function, that's really the name of the game. If you do nothing, white matter disease lesions tend to grow and expand from the existing lesions and just damage more and more a part of the brain. And that's not what we want. Because we can't do anything once white matter damage is present, it's really important that we prioritize brain health as early as possible before the typical age of intervention or concern. Right now we're operating from this model of brain health really seems to become pressing around the age of 65, right? Your hair has got to be fully gray before we start talking about the health of your brain. And everything I know about brain health tells me that's too late. It, we really want to be starting to talk about these things in our 30s and our 40s. Now, that being said, it really is never too late to work towards having the very best brain. So I don't want anyone to get discouraged and think if they're in their 70s and they're listening to this that there's no point. There's absolutely a point. You can definitely make a big impact at any age. But the truth is much of the vascular issues that affect the health of our brain are cumulative over decades and decades. So whatever age you are and you're listening to this, if white matter disease has become something that's on your radar about your health, I want you to take that as a big old warning and really try to investigate it and get yourself active. If you found this video to be helpful, I would be most grateful if you would leave me a little message and let me know. Please do like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. We are so grateful to be here with you. Thank you all so much and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.